everyone. Hello. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here. Um, as you just heard, my name is David. There's a big picture of me. Um, I'm from a place called Trend Watching. Um, at Trend Watching, we are obsessed with consumer trends. So our obsession is with the trends, just reshaping the mindsets, uh, the expectations, the behaviors of consumers all over the world. And that's what I want to talk about today. But of course, you are restaurant people, you are hospitality people. So what I've done is I've just chosen four key consumer trends, four big trends that I think must be on your radar uh, for 2019 and beyond. So trends that I hope can do just a couple of things. Number one, they can give you a handle on some of the big forces out there in consumerism reshaping the entire consumer arena, as you just heard, um, but reshaping the expectations of your guests, your diners. Um, number two, these trends, I hope, are practical. They are actionable. Okay, they are trends you can do something with. Each one is an innovation opportunity. You can take these trends away, you know, create your next experience, create your next service, whatever it is, and know that it's deeply grounded in emerging expectations. Okay, know that you're creating something that people actually want. Um, before we dive into the four trends, I just want to take a step back and look at the nature of trends. Like, what are trends? Uh, where do they come from? Very quickly, because that is going to be super useful for everything that follows. So we have an analysis of trends, an analysis, really, of the world around us at Trend Watching that starts with a very simple observation, and that is change. The world is changing all the time. We live with very rapid change, and we're used to that. You know, technological change, social change, whatever. And you only have to look across the consumer arena, the business arena, um, for the last handful of months to see how fast the world is changing. So uh, just this month, or last month in January, we had people talking about, have Apple reached peak iPhone? The market is saturated. Are their revenues going to decline? And so on. Um, in the middle of last year, we saw the Mark Zuckerberg hauled before the US Senate to account for Facebook's impact on democracy. Uh, it became pretty obvious very quickly that the senators questioning him didn't really understand Facebook or the internet, <laughs> but at least we all got to figure out who it is that Mark reminds us of. <laughs> Finally, the question is answered. Um, you guys will have seen, I'm sure, Gillette uh, running a very interesting advertising campaign just a couple of months ago supporting the Me Too movement. Um, and in Britain, and I promise this is the only time I will mention this, we are forming an orderly queue of lorries to prepare for Brexit. Uh, we were told we need to practice for the queue that will form on our motorways when Brexit happens, so we arranged a queue, a fake queue of 60 lorries. Um, the trouble is they then told us that we really should prepare for 6,000 lorries that will be queuing up. Um, but hey, that's a whole different talk. Now look, here's the thing about all this change. It can throw you off balance. Uh, it's very hard to know how to make sense of it all, let alone how to plot your next move. When you're faced with all this change, you come to a conference, and everyone's talking about AI, blockchain, you know, eco this, whatever. Um, there is a simple, powerful truth that can let you start to get a handle on all this change and see meaningful trends in the change and start to prepare for them. Okay, and here is that truth. Yes, change. Okay, we live in a world of change, but amid all that, we are still the same old humans with the same old basic human needs. So human beings are motivated by a set of basic needs, things like value, convenience, excitement, fun, love, you know, whatever it is. Those core needs are very stable. They don't really change decade on decade. At their most fundamental, they don't change century on century, really. And trends are made of those two building blocks. On the one hand, change. On the other hand, basic human needs. To be more specific about it, we say new trends emerge when some change in the world. Okay, it might be a new technology. It might be a new economic moment. It might be a new mindset. Some change in the world unlocks a new way of serving an age-old basic human need. That's when powerful tr new trends in human behavior and human expectation come about. And crucially, we think the best way to see that happening is to look out to the world of innovation, like the new products, the new services 
the new campaigns, uh, the new experiences being launched now, and just look particularly for those innovations that are serving basic human needs in new ways. And those innovations do something really special, and that is they change people, they rewire people. When an innovation comes along and serves a basic need in a new way, it gives people new behaviors, it gives them new habits. Uh, crucially, it gives them, in the end, new expectations. And then those expectations will spread. They'll spread across markets, they'll spread across demographics and industries, and they will eventually spread all the way to your door. So that's what this talk uh, is going to be all about. Okay? That's why we're so passionate about telling people you live inside an expectation economy. Uh, who are really your competitors? They're not just necessarily the other people in your industry, in dining, in hospitality. They're certainly not just the other people who happen to be geographically around you. They are the brands, the businesses, the startups who are fueling the new expectations, the new consumer expectations that you will eventually face. Okay? And so that's what I want to look at in this talk. We're going to look at four trends, a whole ton of innovations from all kinds of industries, and for you guys, just be relentless about asking yourself, what do these newly emerging consumer expectations mean for us, mean for me? And of course, I will have some thoughts to help you out with that. You know, how can I take these expectations myself and do something that serves those expectations? Um, I hope you will have at least one light bulb moment, you know, one innovation where you're just like, yes, like I see what's going on here. I want to take this innovation. I'm going to run back to my team, run back to the office, run back to the restaurant and say, look, you know, we could do something with this. If you have even just one of those, uh, I hope it will have been very well worth it. So with all that said, um, let's move on to the first trend, which starts here. Let's start with a big, easy, basic human need to start with. Play. Okay? Play is one of those age-old human needs. It's always been a part of human nature. It always will be a part of human nature. Play is a great human need to start with. Uh, I'm going to start with a change in the world that feels like a very long way from play, and that is automation. Automated technologies, robots, artificial intelligence, consumers out there know these technologies are coming. Um, there are reports saying automation technologies will eat you know, 800 million jobs in the next 25, 30 years. Rising numbers of consumers are concerned about the future that automation is leading us to. But, as well as being concerned, they are also curious, okay? They've seen some automated services. They, maybe they've seen you know, the Amazon Go automated store online. Um, they've seen maybe reports of restaurants using IBM's Pepper, this robot, as a, as a waiter. Um, and they're curious about these technologies. The reality is, for most consumers, these automation technologies, robots, AI, so on, they're a novelty. They haven't encountered them much yet. They're curious about them. They want to see what they're all about, okay? So as well as concern, there's curiosity. And also online, consumers have had experiences of automation um, that felt somewhat magical. I'm talking about the type of automated services, you know, maybe an app that allows you to save automatically to your bank account, or even Spotify and the way it perfectly suggests, you know, music to you that you're going to love. Automated services that automate a task so well, it feels somewhat magical. It feels, as they say, auto-magical. Okay? So when you put that entire story together, the hu basic human need for play, uh, rising curiosity about robots and automation services, you come to this first trend. It's called automation theater. It's about saying, in 2019, automation technologies and magical in-person you know, experiences can collide, can combine to create one kind of magical, compelling experience. And I want to show you some examples of what I mean by that. Here's my first example. This is Ministry of Supply. This is a US clothes um, retailer. They've recently launched a new service in store where a robot, essentially, a robotic arm, will shrink a sweater to fit you perfectly right in front of your eyes. Okay, so your measurement 
measurements are taken electronically. Um, you choose a jumper. The jumpers are made of a special fabric that shrinks in response to heat. Uh, it's laid out in front of the robot arm right in front of you, and this robot arm will apply heat and shrink that sweater to fit you perfectly right in front of your eyes. So look, that's about a couple of things. Obviously, number one, it's about automated personalization. Give me an item of clothing that fits me perfectly, and that's pretty standard automation. You know, do something efficiently. It's also, though, about a magical experience. It's about a moment of theater inside that store that people are curious about, that's compelling to people, that appeals to people's sense of play. It's the kind of experience people will travel to have. It's the kind of experience people will tell their friends about, or they'll share on Instagram, like, hey, this was so cool, like, check out what I just saw. This robot you know, shrank my sweater to fit me right in front of my eyes. That's a perfect first example of what I'm talking about when I talk about automation theatre. Um, OK, this is the Ratio Cafe. Uh, it opened its doors in July of last year. This is essentially an automation theatre coffee shop, what I would call an automation theatre coffee shop. You uh, order your coffee, you walk in the doors, you sit down, you order your coffee via an app, um, and then you watch as these robotic arms make the exact coffee you ordered. It's called ratio because you can specify the exact ratio of coffee to milk and water and the strength of the coffee and all this stuff. The robot makes the coffee exactly the way you wanted it to be, and then, crucially, it's brought to you by a human server with a smile. Okay, but again, so yes, this is about getting the perfect coffee, it's about an automated service that says, we will serve you the perfect coffee. But also think about it. It's about a magical, compelling, in-person experience. Okay? It's about a moment of theater, watching these robotic arms do their work. Okay? Again, it's the kind of experience people will travel to see, they'll talk about. Um, where is this trend automation theater heading more broadly? This is really interesting. This is Alibaba um, opening the Fly Zoo Hotel uh, in China uh, a few months ago, kind of late last year. This is essentially a hotel that deploys all kinds of automation technologies just to deliver what Alibaba calls a futuristic experience to guests. I'm just going to show you the video, and then we'll talk about it a bit more. But it looks like this. Check it out. Uh, Okay, so you check in using facial recognition, the lifts work using facial recognition, there's a robot waiter that will mix you the perfect cocktail, the, uh, there are robots roaming around that will deliver you your laundry to your room, all that. It's all intended to create a broad experience that says you are staying in the hotel of the future. Yes, it's about efficiency, yes, it's about getting stuff done, but it's also about the theater of that, it's about the novelty of that experience. Now look, I know what you're thinking. Here's this guy from Trendwatching. He's obsessed with robots. He's trying to tell me that the future of hospitality and restaurants is robots, right? No, I am not saying that, OK? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, the only way to create a magical, compelling experience in 2019 is by using robots, right? I'm not saying every time you automate something, it has to be visible. It has to be a moment of theater. Lots of automation should be hidden. I'm just saying. If you want to create magical, compelling experiences in 2019, in 2020, 2021, because of this range of factors, these changes we're talking about, deploying automation and robots in a magical, compelling way can be a counterintuitive way to create that spectacle, to create that moment of magic. Yes, lots of moments of magic are fueled by your, your staff, your people, real people with a smile, with feelings, and all of that. But there's a new way now, too. And that tool can be part of your armory um, for the next few years. And look, here's a final example that I just think 
it does a great job of combining uh, robots and people, basically robots and true human values. This is a new cafe in Tokyo. It's staffed entirely by robots, but those robots are controlled by disabled people who find it difficult to work you know, in most physical environments because of their disabilities. Okay, so just a wonderful example of creating an automation theater type restaurant that actually also supports human values. And when you go to this restaurant, you know, you know you're doing something that's truly good. This is a really worthwhile enterprise. So look, I would love you guys to take your first light bulb moment there to just ask yourself, how could you deploy automation technology in 2019? not just to make things more efficient, not just to offer more personalization, but to create a moment of automation theater, a magical, compelling spectacle for consumers that they will travel to see, that will be playful, that will be fun. OK, let's race on to trend number two. Uh, let's start with a different uh, human need, which we touched on right at the end there, and that is values. Like, everyone wants to feel that they are living a life in accordance with their deepest values, with their deepest principles. Again, that's been, always been a part of human nature. It always will be. And we at Trend Watching have been tracking the quest for a better consumerism, a more sustainable, more ethical consumerism since, like, ever. You know, it's just an ongoing mega trend that you guys know all about, too. Um, we saw a real tipping point moment when it comes to products and their sustainability in 2018. Like single use plastics was probably the biggest uh, sort of ethical, sustainable consumerism issue of 2018. And as you guys know, we saw a whole ton of you know, supermarkets and restaurants and all kinds of people banning single use plastics. Okay, but the truth is, and that's great, but the truth is that more broadly, and we all know this from our own lives, consumers are still stuck in something of a guilt spiral when it comes to the impacts of their consumerism. They know their own consumerism has negative impacts on the planet, on society, sometimes on their own health, um, but it's very hard to stop. That brings me to this second trend. It's called end of excess, and it's about saying the tipping point moment that we saw for products in 2018 is set to spread to experiences too. And people will be looking uh, to have compelling, great, amazing experiences minus the guilt, minus the negative impact on the planet. That's what this trend is all about. Now look, it starts here with the type of example that you guys will have seen a ton before. This is a new version of it. This is iGen. It's, um, it's a zero-waste restaurant in Bali, so it's all seafood that's caught locally by hand. The, the furniture is all wood and foam offcuts that have been reclaimed. The floor's made of broken plates and glass that were reclaimed. Uh, any food waste at the end of the day is recycled to feed the local pigs, like to feed the local animals. It's just a zero-waste concept for this restaurant. And we've all seen you know, some of these before, and that will continue to evolve. Now look. When it comes to end of excess, like great experiences minus the guilt, you just can't walk away and turn your restaurant or your establishment or your offering into a zero waste offering overnight. And that's okay, consumers understand that. What they will want to see from you in 2019 is just a sense that you're moving in the right direction. It's about showing your values by moving in the right direction. Like, check out this example. This is High Fly. They're an airline. They recently ran the world's first single-use plastic-free flight. Um, it was from Lisbon to Sao Paulo. They replaced all the single-use plastics with like recycled or compostable um, alternatives, and they're committed to eliminating all single-use plastics on their flights by the end of 2019. Now, look, this is about moving in the di right direction. We all know flying is not the most sustainable activity, certainly right now. Um, Here's just one small step they've taken to make that in-person experience somewhat more sustainable, to minimize the negative impact. The airline industry is crazy for single-use plastics, like flights globally worldwide use thousands and thousands of tons of single-use plastics. They're just saying, look, we're trying to address that issue. We're trying to give you this experience minus at least a part of the guilt you may feel about the negative impact on it. You can also think broadly about the kind of values that are evolving among your consumers, among your guests, and how you cater to them. Again, this is a set of expectations you guys will know well. Veganism. We just saw a couple of months ago the London Hilton opening the first vegan room. 
Like, all the entire room is made of plant-based materials. The mini bar is totally vegan. The room service is totally vegan. They partnered with the vegan society to create it. Like, as you guys well know, you know, veganism is a, is a food trend that's come a long way in the last five years or so. Would we have seen the Hilton doing this? Yeah, like even three, four years ago, it probably wasn't really on their radar. But they've seen that new values are evolving, and they're thinking about how they can cater to those values. In terms of where this trend is heading um, in the years ahead, it's most exciting when you start to think beyond just minimizing the negative impact to experiences that really support a positive impact on the environment, on the local surroundings. Copenhagen have just built the world's most advanced um, waste-to-energy plant in the middle of their city. So this is a plant that burns urban waste and turns it into clean electricity for Copenhagen. Uh, but they haven't just done that. They've built a, a ski slope on the top of it, so now you can go skiing right in the middle of Copenhagen and support this clean energy initiative. It looks like this. I just want to show you what it looks like. Okay, you get the idea. So that's a pretty magical experience. Go skiing right in the middle of Copenhagen. But when you have that magical experience, in this case, you know you're also supporting the world's most advanced attempt to generate clean urban energy. You're doing something truly good for the environment because you're supporting that initiative. And this is all part of Copenhagen's attempt to be the world's first carbon-free city by, I think it's 2025. Okay, so you can think about positive impact too. But like I said, this is one step at a time. It starts with moving in the right direction. If you can just ask yourself, how can we minimize the negative impacts associated with, with our experience? How can we minimize the guilt associated with our experience in 2019? You are asking yourself a really powerful question that taps into a really powerful set of emerging expectations for consumers. And, you know, if they see an air, like I say, airlines are not the world's most sustainable industry. When they see airlines addressing this trend, what do they start to expect from you guys? Okay, when they see, you don't remember, you don't have to do this stuff, you just have to see it to have your mindset change. When they see that you can go skiing in Copenhagen on top of the world's first or most advanced clean energy, urban clean energy plant, what do they start to expect from you guys? That's the question I would love you to walk away with. Okay, let's race on <clears throat> excuse me, to trend number three, which we can do rattle through pretty quickly. Community is the basic human need here. Human beings are social animals. We need a sense of place, and we need a sense of community in our lives. Again, just age-old truth about human nature. There's a couple of things disrupting that. The one is we're, we're all hermits now, living on-demand lifestyles. Everything comes to our house from Amazon Prime. All the food we eat comes to our house through Uber Eats. Okay, I mean, I'm exaggerating, not all of it. But the on-demand lifestyle has atomized society even more. It's put us all in our own homes, in our own little individual boxes. And we know that we're all addicted to our smartphones. Okay, that's helping to atomize society too. We're all stuck to our smartphones. The only light we see is the little glow we get over our face. Like right? when we're reading whatever email it is we're reading, one tiny glimpse of that. If you have teenage children, this won't surprise you. It surprises me actually that they're so honest. 54% of them say they use, they spend too much time on their phone. The rest of them obviously are lying. Um, yeah. This brings me to this third trend, Village Squared. It's about in-person experiences in 2019 that just help repair the social fabric. 
that help repair that sense of social atomization that is so prevalent right now for a whole host of reasons that I haven't mentioned, but also on-demand lifestyles, technology, urban living, all of that. I just want to show you three very quick examples of what I mean by this. Um, this is Lululemon, the big uh, US yoga, yoga apparel brand. They recently uh, partnered with the big publisher, Penguin Random House, to, in their flagship store, launch a pop-up library where consumers could come, they could sit down, there were a thousand books in there, and just find a space to come together, to talk, to converse. They're going to have author meetups in there, they're going to hold food events in there, just a little pop-up in the middle of their flagship store in New York that helps to bring people together in an interesting new way. This is Nike doing something similar. It's opened, it's reopened its first store. This is a store, the first store it ever opened in 1967 um, in Santa Monica. It's reopened this uh, as, a, as a community space for runners. Okay, so that's what it evolved into in 67, when running, when going jogging was a really kind of fringe activity. They've reopened it now, again, as a community space where runners, where joggers, where fitness fanatics can come and meet and talk and converse, just a space that helps repair the social fabric. And this is Ibis Hotels, like really going all out on the trend that we would call Village Squared, like going, just totally committing to it, so announcing recently they are going to rebrand their entire positioning, their entire offering around the idea of community and connection. So they are going to rebuild their entire, uh, all their, their properties, their entire hotel portfolio around what they call life hub spaces that are open to the community too. And they will encourage guests and members of the local community to interact much more. They'll have local artists coming in and giving talks. They'll have local chefs coming in and doing the cooking for the night and bringing other members of the community in, just encouraging the guests in that location to mix with members of the local community in a much more meaningful way because they say that's what the hotel experience should be about now. It shouldn't just be about a bed for the night. It should be about real connection to the community you are in. So again, you know, you don't have to commit to this trend at that level. You don't have to rebuild your entire offering around the trend that is Village Squared. But it's such a powerful question for you guys to ask yourself, how in 2019 can we address this trend? We live in very atomized times. Like this. We're very atomized individual societies. How can I build an experience or a service that just repairs some of that, that brings people together in new and interesting ways. Okay, just about time for my final trend before I wrap up, uh, which starts with this big human need. I've, l I've left the biggest one till last. I've been talking to you about basic human needs all through this talk. We are very lucky in, in our societies. Our most basic human needs are met. When you think about food, shelter, security, for the most part, those needs are met. And in that kind of environment, another higher order human need rises to the surface, and that is status. Okay? In affluent societies like ours, status is one of the key drivers of all consumer behavior. And we all know what old-fashioned, traditional consumer status looks like. It looks like this, okay? It's the amazing supercar, the very expensive holiday, the Gucci handbag, whatever. Basically markers, objects that say, I have a lot, okay? I am materially affluent. We've seen a big shift over the last two, three decades, maybe. We live now, and you guys know this well, in an experience economy. Increasingly, it's experiences, rare, amazing, incredible experiences that people are turning to to get and display their status. And that shift has been massively amplified, of course, by a connected world, okay, by, by an Instagram world, by a Facebook world, by a Twitter world, which turns every experience into a very shareable status currency that you can broadcast to millions of people, potentially, online. You can say, look, I've done this. I've had this rare, incredible, amazing experience that you haven't had. Okay, what is the big change I want to address with this trend, then? The big change is virtual worlds. People are starting to have experiences in virtual worlds, too. I'm talking about in digital worlds, in video games, in augmented reality, in virtual reality, 
People are having ex true experiences in those worlds now as well, and that is scaling up. This is Fortnite, the video game. We'll talk about it more in a second. This isn't just a few people. This is sometimes millions of people having these experiences. And that brings me to this final trend. It's called virtual experience economy. And very simply, it's about saying, in a world where people are having virtual experiences, digital, AR, VR, experiences that are as real to them, as meaningful to them, as experiences they're having in the real world, then those virtual experiences will become a status currency too. That's all I'm saying, okay? I'm saying if real-world experiences are a status currency, then now virtual experiences will become a status currency too, not just about the entertainment, not just about the information, also about the status, about an experience in its own right that you want to tell the world you have had because it marks you out as special. I've done this amazing thing. Let me show you a few examples of what I mean. Here's a great one to start with. This is the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Just doing something pretty simple, running a David Bowie, a big David Bowie exhibition um, in virtual reality and augmented reality. So you could access this exhibition via a tablet, you could access it via virtual reality kind of goggles. Um, and inside the exhibition, you just had a three-dimensional tour of some of David Bowie's most iconic artifacts, some of his most iconic costumes. Okay, yes, it's not quite the same as being able to touch it, but if you're a huge David Bowie fan and this, this real exhibition is not coming to your city, that is the next best thing, and that is, the, that is an experience you will be proud of. It's a status currency. You will share it online. You will tell your friends, I had this amazing experience. I got to see the, you know, the, the costume he wore on stage in 76 or whatever it is, okay? Cultural experiences have always been a status currency, or for a long time they've been a status currency. Now, cultural experiences in VR, in AR, will be a status currency too. I promised we'd talk about Fortnite. You guys, I'm sure, all know this. Um, the online uh, battle royale game that has millions of players every day playing it, okay? Uh, earlier, in January, they started advertising that there would be a special event hosted inside Fortnite on one particular Saturday morning. Okay, they trailed this event and they trailed it, they advertised it and they advertised it. When that Saturday morning came, there were 10 million people live inside Fortnite to watch a 10-minute concert by a DJ whose name is Marshmallow. 10 million people had assembled in this video game to watch this live concert. It looked like this. Okay, I'll leave you to make your own judgment about the music. Um, but when 10 million people are assembling in a virtual space to watch a concert, you know something really meaningful is happening. So the DJ Marshmallow was in a real room in New York. He was really playing that concert. He was represented by a 3D avatar on the stage that you see. All the people inside your game were, trans were, were sort of teleported to that stage. You only saw the people in your game, so that was maybe 30 people, but there were 10 million people watching that concert live, okay? And just as previous generations were gonna say, like, I'm a, I was at Woodstock, I saw the Sex Pistols at the 100 Club, I saw Nirvana, whatever it is, okay, we are gonna have a generation of people saying, I was there live for this concert, I really saw that live, okay? It might seem strange to us, but that is the shift that's happening. Virtual experiences are becoming meaningful to people, and when they become meaningful to people, they become a status currency. Um, this is a, in China. It opened its doors in May of last year, the Oriental Science Fiction Valley theme park. Not such a catchy name, uh, but what's different about this theme park is that all 30 rides are inside virtual reality. So this is a VR theme park. The entire experience that you're going to have happens inside VR. But look, you don't have to go away again and create an incredible you know, virtual reality experience. You don't have to gather 10 million people inside Fortnite for your next experience. It's the underlying expectations here I want you to think about. I'm not saying go away and copy these examples. I'm saying think about an emerging set of expectations where digital experiences, virtual experiences, 
are becoming a status currency in their own right. And in the end, those experiences can be simple if you want them to be. Um, this is Celebrity Cruises, the big cruise company, uh, recently launched a new cruise experience. And part of that experience is kind of virtual animation when you're at the dinner table. Okay, so via overhead projectors, when you place your order, you see a little animation on your table of that dish being put together. So when you order dessert, a chef comes onto your table, animated chef, he heaves a snowball onto your plate, some cannons come along and they fire nuts onto your plate. This is all being projected from above, um, and people love this. They share this on Instagram like crazy. It's a simple, virtual, simple digital experience that becomes a status currency in its own right. So that is the trend I'd love to leave you with, as well as the other three. Just have a think about that set of expectations. You are people so accustomed to and totally expert in delivering real-world physical experiences that are amazing, that are compelling, that people want to tell their friends about, that they want to share. The world is shifting. That's always going to be important. But now there's a shift where virtual experiences, too, can deliver that kind of status hit, can be shareable in that way. And that's a super powerful trend for you guys. Okay, it's time for me to get out of here. As well as the four trends, I hope I've just given you a new way of seeing the world that you can take out there with you and use to become your own trend watcher. If you want to do that, just go out into the world. When you see something new, product, innovation, experience, service, whatever it is, just ask yourself, what new expectations is this innovation going to generate? Okay, When people use or see this innovation, what new things will they start to expect? What will they start to expect from me? If you go out into the world doing that, you can start to spot trends of your own, and then you can put those trends to use. Uh, it's no good just knowing about trends. You have to use them. Use these trends to create something new, to delight your customers, to delight your diners. But that is more than enough from me. It's been super fun talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.